known today as the Worldwide Pentecostal Fellowship. This is in our 10th peak to be at. 10 is the biblical number of judgment. There were 10 generations from Adam to Noah. God destroyed the world with water. 10 generations from Noah to Abraham and God began with a Jewish nation, a clear lineage to Jesus. There were 10 commandments given on Mount Sinai, 10 lepers healed by Jesus, 10 virgins, five wise and five fools. Rebecca was deemed worthy to be called the bride of Isaac after having watered 10 camels who drank 30 gallons at one setting. Of course, God requires of us one tenth of every dollar that we earn. Ten has been a year of judgment at our national youth conference. Pentecostal in experience and apostolic in knowledge. And God has judged us righteously from the very outset. We honor our elders this morning. Elders Crawford Coon and brothers Johnny Godair and Kenny Godair, and then Bishop Nathaniel Wilson, and brother Floyd Odom, and then brother Larry Booker, our chairman, the esteemed elders. These are true men of God who without them, none of us would be here today. If there's ever been an hour when we need men, this is that hour. God give us men. Times like this demand strong minds, great hearts, true faith, and ready hands. Men whom lust for office does not kill, men whom spoils of office cannot buy. Men who have honor, men who will not lie. Tall men, sun crowned, who live above the fog in godly duty and apostolic thinking. Men who can stand before the demagogue and damn his treacherous flatteries without winking. For while the rabble with their thumb-worn creeds, large professions and little deeds mingle in selfish strife, freedom weeps, wrong rules the land, and waiting justice sleeps. God give us men. The men represented as our executive council you may know precious little about them, but there is another group of men that is represented on the platform this afternoon who will be closer to your heroes of the faith. They will be men that will impress you, men that will imprint you. And I want to assure you today that as apostolic young people, the furthering of the gospel of the truth of who Jesus is will come upon the shoulders of men like as are represented in the Worldwide Pentecostal Fellowship that are responsible for this conference this week. And I want you to honor them today with a hand clap and let them know how appreciative you are of you. Thank God for you. Stand with us across the sanctuary. And with us this afternoon, I want to say that it is both an high privilege and signal honor of mine to have been asked to be the preacher for this morning. And with God as my help, I want to preach to you from the word of the Lord, Ephesians chapter number two and verse number 20. And are built upon the foundation of of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I've chosen for a subject this morning, the original apostolics. The original apostolics. God bless you as you see in the fear of the Lord this morning. The first thing, or the being of its kind, is what is known as the original. The original serves as the model 
for all following periods. The original apostolics of the book of Acts are represented in this arena today. See, an entire belief system can become extinct from one generation to the next simply because it did not have the proper role models to imprint its succeeding generation. And what has been handed to us this morning, the truth of God's word and the apostolic message that has been preserved absolute, not relative, but absolute, has been given to us because the original apostolic church for the past 2,000 and more years has preserved for us what has been handed down to us today. They did not quit. They persevered. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, and the road you tread seems all uphill, when the money is low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you can only sigh, when care has pressed you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't ever quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a fellow has turned about when he might have won, had he stuck it out. So don't give up when the pace seems slow. You just might succeed with one more blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to the faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to his golden crown. Success is but failure turned inside out, the silver tint in the clouds of doubt. And you never know how close you are. You may be near, you may be far. So stick to your fight when your heart is hit. It's when things go wrong that you mustn't quit. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly. The word continue means to go on without interruption. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. First Corinthians 15.58, for as much as they knew that their labor was not in vain in the Lord. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That was first. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And any of our youth which have a streak of apostolicness inside of them are always in danger of imagining themselves to be the lone survivors of a vanishing breed. And if any one generation fails to hand to, they, to their successors the apostolic message as has been handed to us, all will have been for nothing. Hebrews 11, 40 said that they without us would not be made perfect. There's a church in the grave this morning who have already gone on to meet their reward that are being perfected in this house of God today. There are four things that has been said that cometh not back. The first is the spoken word. The second is the spared arrow. The third is time passed and finally a neglected opportunity. An opportunity has been handed to the apostolics of 2018, unlike has been handed to any of our previous generations. God warned the nation of Israel that when you come into the land that I have given unto to you, and you're living in houses that you did not build and drinking from wells that you did not dig, 
eating from vineyards that you did not plant. Beware lest thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. There are some that would forget. Jeremiah 2 and 19, the word of the Lord says, For my people have committed two great evils. They were not strangers, but they were original ones. They have committed two great evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn them out cisterns, yea, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Only a fool would trade the fountainhead of living water that is not dependent upon elements for a broken cistern that is dependent upon Increment our good weather. Only a fool would do that. It does not take a righteous man or woman to break with tradition. It does not take a spiritual man or woman to break the chain of succession that has been passed to them. But any man that would regretfully do that and make that mistake, that man is a fool. Paul said in Galatians 1 and 7, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the gospel of Christ unto another, which is not another. But there be some among you that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But I thank God for his word today. As has been since the days of St. Paul and the original apostolics, there are some that trouble him and there are some that trouble us today. And there are some that want to trouble you today, mock and ridicule and persecute you. But it wound up saying in Galatians 1 and 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, come preaching any other gospel than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I again. Paul gave us a further redundancy. So we are an angel from heaven. Come preaching any other gospel than what I have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. In Hebrews chapter 2, the word of the Lord said, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest need of the things which we have heard. Yes, at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was said fast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first it was originally handed down to us from the Lord Himself, and it was put upon the men and the women that were built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself. And what we preach today is the absolute, pure and unadulterated word of God that was not handed to us from the councils of the fourth century. Neither was it handed to us from the 1906 revivals of the Sousa Street. But what was handed to us, it goes much further back than that. Way back in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. In a place called Jerusalem, Israel, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where they were all with one mind and in one accord. And we have an awesome responsibility this morning with the great blessings that have been handed to us, with the great privileges that have been fought for by our predecessors. We also have an awesome responsibility. In Proverbs 22, 28, the word of the Lord said, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set 
In Proverbs 22.10, he said, Remove not the old landmark, neither enter thou into the fields of the fatherless. Amen. And I want you to know this morning that what has been handed and what we prize as the power and the unction and the anointing that is resident in this house, it does not come without sacrifice. It will not be maintained without responsibility. Oh, don't take for granted what has happened in this sanctuary from the very outset on Wednesday night. Amen. And I want to preach to you today about the original apostolics. The original apostolics. Are we tempted and are we persecuted? Yes, we are. As Jesus was tempted 40 days in the wilderness by hell's chief demon upon three different occasions. And Jesus was approached and tempted by Satan. And Satan said unto them, Command these stones that there be made bread. But Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus said, I'm of the original church. I'm not only in the bread business. We live in a society that is big on philanthropy and they're big on benevolence and they want to hand out bread to the masses and have the church gone down to the hog den and set up a soup kitchen for the prodigal son. He never would have been mad enough to come to himself to get up and go back to the father's house. We're not just in the bread business. Apostolic young people, uh, uh, there's some uh, in the 21st century, uh, they, all they have uh, is a handout, uh, and they can't give a hand up to anybody. Uh, Peter and John said, silver and gold, uh, have I none, but such as I have, we don't have the most money, we don't have the most bread, we don't have the best trinkets and handouts, uh, but we've got uh, the name of Jesus. And secondly, Satan said unto Jesus, Don't you see all these kingdoms? If you bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you. He said they belong to me. The devil is a liar. In Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It may have been temporarily possessed by the devil, but he was not the owner of it. The devil might have possession of Mother Earth right now, but he's not in control of it. Hell's not in control of any one of us, but Jesus is in charge. He's still the boss of Pentecost. The apostolics that are original are still in charge today. He said, I'm not in the political business either. He said, I am not concerned about owning uh, this society. And we've been so brainwashed by high energy, hyped up uh, Balaam prophets uh, with silver tongue oratorical excellency uh, that we think we're going to take our cities and take our world. Uh, that God never did intend uh, for us to do that. He said, ye uh, are the salt of the earth. Uh, a little bit of salt goes along way. There's more substance than there is salt. But a little bit of salt that hadn't lost its savor and still has the original pungency, it's still enough to do what God wants us to do in our city. We're not in the political business. Amen. But he tells you, uh, number three, he said, finally, uh, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, uh, amen, pull thyself off of this pinnacle, uh, and your angels have been given charge over you. Uh, but Jesus said, I'm not in the bread business, uh, I'm not in the politician business, uh, and I'm not in the show business either. Uh, I'm not going to pull myself down uh, and be tempted by you. Uh, let me tell you, the original apostolics are not in the show business. We're not here to put on a play today. This isn't pretty at all. The Old Testament tabernacle was ugly on the outside, but until you got on the inside, that's why God don't want you to doll up the outside and paint up the outside and make up the outside. He said, I want you to be original. I want you to be just like the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
and for the nations around in them and look from the high lofty mountains and say what is it about these two million Jews that they follow that cloud and that fire and they set up that tabernacle and pull it down we don't understand them what is it about them that makes them follow that old ugly house but let me tell you the world will never understand us the world will never comprehend what's happening in here until you get into the most holy place and feel the Shekinah unction of the Holy Ghost. You never understand, but the originals understand. Amen. The original church. I'm talking about the original apostolics this morning. The original apostolics did not even hear about a Trinitarian Godhead. They knew that there was one God and his name was Jesus. In Genesis, they knew that Jesus was the creator. In Exodus, they knew that Jesus was the lawgiver. In Leviticus, they knew Jesus was the high priest. In Numbers, they knew he was the great statistician. In Deuteronomy, they knew he was the one God of Israel. In Joshua, they knew he was the captain of the Lord's host. In Judges, they knew he was the judge of all the earth. In Ruth, they knew Jesus was the king's redeemer. In First Kings, they knew that Jesus was the king of all kings. Amen. In First and Second Samuel, they knew he was a prophet seer, a mighty prophet of Israel. In Chronicles, they knew that Jesus was a great record keeper. He keeps every record of what you're doing. He never forgets. I said, God keeps good records. In the book of Job, he was the God that answered out of the whirlwind, the daysman. In the book of Psalms, he was the song at midnight. In Psalm 22, Jesus was a good shepherd. In Psalm 23, Jesus was a great shepherd. In Psalm 24, Jesus was a chief shepherd. The good shepherd of Psalm 22 lays down his life for his sheep. In Psalm 23, a great shepherd raises from the dead for his sheep. In Psalm 24, a chief shepherd comes back again for his sheep. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. His name is Jehovah Rohi. The Lord my shepherd, I shall not want Jehovah Jireh. He supplies all my needs. He maketh me to lie down. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. He restores my soul. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace. He, oh, he, he leads me through the paths of righteousness. Jehovah said to me, the Lord my righteousness. He there's a table before me when I walk through the valley of the shadow. He's Jehovah Shammah. He's the present one. I lay prepared a table. I set up at the table and I watch my enemies fall. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. And no matter where you look, the original apostolics I knew that there was one God with no trinity and no distinction of persons. And we don't, we don't rub shoulders with the Trinitarians. We don't want to be ecumenical. We don't want to be perceived of inclusive. We want to be exclusive when it comes to who Jesus is. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you're not going to make the rapture. If you don't believe that Jesus, John 8 and 24, now, oh, John 8 and 24, he said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8 and 27, they understood not that he spake to them of his father. Jesus said, I and my father are one. We're not two, we're not three, but we're all one. The original apostolics have said that Philip came to Jesus and said, well, show us the father, and it's 
a place with us. And Jesus said, I've been so long with you, yet has thou not known me, but he that has seen me, has seen the Father. In Genesis 17 and 1, Jesus was the Almighty God. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus was the Almighty God. He said, I got all power. In Revelation 1 and 8, Jesus said, I am the Almighty. The Father was Almighty, the Son was Almighty, and the Holy Ghost was Almighty. For well, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And all these three are one. And if somebody comes with another gospel, you let them be a curse. I said, you let them be a curse. We don't have any half-brothers. We don't have any friends of the bride. We don't have, we're original apostolics. And we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. God is the power, the power of God and the salvation. Jesus, he's a mighty God. Jesus is. And the original apostolics, they were water baptized by submersion in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2 and 41, that the Jews were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 8 and 12, the Samaritans were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 8 and 13, of Simon the sorcerer was baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 8 and 38, the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized in Jesus' name. In in Acts 9 and 18, Paul, formerly known as Saul, was baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 10 46, the Gentiles were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 16 33, the Philippian jailer was baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 19 and 6, the Ephesus church was baptized in Jesus' name. Someone made an erroneous statement. And said, we don't read, rather obey Jesus' command of Matthew 28 and 19. Then we have Peter's command of Acts 2 and 38. I wouldn't argue with you for a moment. I'd rather obey Jesus than I had Peter myself. That's why we obey Jesus. And we're the only ones that do obey Jesus. If you baptize in a title, Father, you didn't obey Matthew 28 and 19. Somebody said, then what is your baptismal formula? Our formula is Matthew 28 and 19, baptize him in the name of the Father. John 5 and 43, Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. In the name of the Son. Matthew 1 and 21, his name is Jesus. In the name of the Holy Ghost. John 14, 26, his name is Jesus. We don't go back to the 4th century of some Roman Emperor Constantine, who was the father and the edict of the mother harlot Roman Catholic Church, of which every other three God, the infant baptism, transubstantiation, the leading, forbidding men to marry, and all the doctrines of purgatory, and every other hellish doctrine that came out of the councils of the 4th century. We don't go back there, friend. We go back to the upper room on the day of Pentecost. That's my original parents. They were staggering, stumbling drunks. Fire set on them. Don't put any gas on the fire just yet. The original church was a tongue-talking church. In Acts 10 and 1, Cornelius was a devout man. Cornelius prayed to God always. Cornelius, with the entirety of his house, feared God. Cornelius gave a lot of alms to people. But he did all four of those things without being a spirit-filled believer. He wasn't a spirit-filled believer until 44 verses later. Let me tell you, just because you're devout, and just because you pray, and just because you give a lot of money to religion, and you in your house fear God doesn't make you a citizen of heaven. It doesn't make you a candidate for streets of gold. But until Cornelius, you can't get good to get God. You have to have God to be good. And Cornelius was a tongue talker when the Spirit of God fell on him. 
in Acts 2 and 4, the original apostolics talk in another language. In Acts 10 and 40, the original apostolics talk in other tongues. In Acts 19, the original apostolics talk in other... 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. It's a sign that you're spirit filled. Just because you have a lot of good characteristics and you say that you're a religious man does not make you spirit filled. That you are not spirit filled until John 3 and 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the language thereof. You can't tell where it came from, you don't know where it's going. But everybody that's ever been born of the Holy Ghost, uh, there was a language that came with it. Uh, if you don't like it, uh, you need to get the Holy Ghost. Uh, if you don't believe it, uh, you need to be original apostolic. The original apostolics are not ecumenical. The original apostolics we are who we hang around with. In Habakkuk 2, the priest asked the question, if one bearing holy flesh in his garment, if he were to touch a dead body, would he make the dead body clean? Or would the dead body make the priest unclean? He said it's an easy answer. We don't make the dead clean, but the dead defiles us and makes us unclean. The answer is that there is no doctrine that can stand up to the original church's doctrine. But that doesn't mean that we won't dialogue with you. Anybody that tells you dialogue is all right is another messenger. You let him be a curse. We don't want dialogue. We want to preach to you. You can't preach to me, but I can preach to you. You can't tell me the truth, but I can tell you the truth. Hallelujah. The original. Satan is not fighting those churches that are in false doctrine. He's joining them. He does more by sowing tares among the wheat than by pulling wheat. And he doesn't want to, to join our church. He wants to destroy us. But I thank God for his word. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. For we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The original church was a worshiping church. There's three kinds of worship. Idol, idol, and idol. There was idol worship. That's found in, in Amos 5 and 21. It was I-D-L-E. God said, I hate your feasts. I despise your worship services. You built your altar in the wrong place, and you got the wrong message. And until you go back to the old landmark in Jerusalem, I'm not going to listen to your prayers. You've got to get back to the old landmark. He you said your worship is I-D-L-E, idol. And then there's idol worship. Exodus 20 and 3. Thou shalt have no other gods, idols before me. Men don't have trouble finding idolatry. Every basketball star, every football star, every major league, clutch grabbing, tobacco spitting, whoremongering, baseball player is not a god that you should worship. He might be a god to somebody, but Jesus is the true god. But then there's idol worship, I-D-E-A-L. For the Father seeketh such to worship him that will be original in spirit and in truth. I will see you. Clear out a little bit right here. The original apostolic church is not a dance only church. You can put on your shiny shoes and you can dance on a television broadcast. But when it comes to our running, that's reserved for the original apostolics. Because you can't look pretty running. But when you get the Holy Ghost down in your. Jeremiah said it's like fire. Shut up, shut up, shut up in my bones. God don't need no matches. He's a fire all by himself. You ought to let somebody run right now. I said you ought to let somebody run right now. 
What kind of church is this? This is an hour running. Holy Ghost. Jesus name. Barn storming. Wind rattling. Shing a pulling. Hell fire. A devil chasing. Holy rolling church. I said, I said the original apostolics, and I've come with serious business today. The world will always have a counterfeit, but I don't know if you ever thought about it, there would not be a counterfeit had there not have been an original. Even Satan himself transformed himself into an ex angel of light. Oh, there will always be an anti-Jesus for the real Jesus. There will always be a false church for the true church. There will always be a Hercules for Samson. There will always be a Spartan 300 at Thermopylae for Gideon's 300 of Assyria, there'll always be, there'll always be a nightclub party, and there'll always be a beat party, there'll always be a bar room. Hey. I'm original apostolic, said I'm original apostolic, I'm original apostolic. I go back a long ways. I come from a long line of drunks. My daddy was a drunk and he was a druggy too. He was drugged to every youth conference and I was drugged to every youth conference too. I've had a drug problem my whole life. I've had a drinking problem my whole life. I'm not an alcoholic. Alcoholics go to AA. I'm a drunk. Drunks keep on coming to the bar and get them a fresh drink. Hey. Original Apostolics, Hebrews 11.15 And truly if they had been made mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have an opportunity to have returned. The Original Apostolics have ladies that wear dresses. I'm telling you that God never wanted a woman to wear that which pertained to a man. In Genesis 3 and 7, they sewed fig leaves together, a unisex garment. There was no distinction between Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3 and 21, God said, that's not the covering I chose for you. So he made Adam a coat and he made Eve a dress. And he said, now I can distinguish between the two. In Deuteronomy 22 and 5, it was an abomination for a woman to wear that was pertaining unto a man, and for men to wear women's apparel. It was an abomination for men to lie with men, and women to lie with women. And I'm telling you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were the original. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the originals. When King Darius erected that plane out on the Shinar and said, bow down to that 666 beast, it was 600 and three score and six in height and stature and width. And he said, that's man's worship. But there was three apostolic boys on the plane. I said, oh, King Wilson, yeah, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. It God wants us to go to that fiery furnace. We're not careful. We're not careful. The homosexuals and the lesbians are not careful. They march in our cities. The baby killers are not careful. They murdered 60 million babies in the womb. The Republicans are not careful. The Democrats are not careful. And I've come to tell you the original episodics are not careful. But they're born again. The original episodics 
and women whose hair is uncut. First Corinthians 11 and 9. For this cause of the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The angels have sat on that mercy seat. That mercy seat that covered the Ark of the Covenant. Wherein was there and drawed the buttons and the tablets and stone the law. And then there was the pot of manna. The manna represented blessing. The law represented authority. And the law represented power. And God said, I want power on your head. And when a woman has power on her head, she's got authority in her life. She's got authority with her husband. She's got authority with her children. She's got power in her prayer. She's got blessings from the throne of God. The original apostolics were clean shaven men. In Exodus 13 44, the sign of the leper was to cover his lip and cry, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. It was a sign of leprosy. It was a deadening of the senses and the nerves. The more dead a young man becomes to the Spirit of God, the more like the world he wants to get. To. And the only way he can show it is by losing his distinguishing characteristics of being a clean shaven apostolic man. In First Timothy 2 and 8, uh, that woman uh, adorn themselves in modest apparel uh, with shame facedness. Uh, and what colorful makeup is to a woman, uh, a facial hair is to a man. Uh, why don't you come off of your pride for high horse? Uh, and why don't you be apostolic? Uh, the original apostolics uh, are clean shaven. The original apostolics. We live in a society that looks like they fell face first into a pawn shop tackle box. And they've got piercings in their lips and their nose and their eyelids. And they've got them all over their body. But God said the gold in the tabernacle was representative of Jesus Christ. And when you put the gold on the outside, you deify your flesh. And God said, I want the gold on the inside. A golden light. A golden table. A golden altar. And a Golden Ark. The original apostolics said, I'll give up any jewelry I gotta give up because I'm gonna walk on it for eternity on streets of gold. I'm gonna walk on gold. The original apostolics believe in the imminent rapture of the church. They believe that Jesus Christ was coming back. Paul said, we which are alive and will pain. Somebody said, do we believe in post-tribulation rapture, pre-tribulation rapture? The answer is, it's not a test of fellowship. If you believe in pre-tribulation rapture, we're going to make the rapture and miss the tribulation. If you believe in post, you're going to miss it and go through it. But it's not a test of fellowship. But the scripture said, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words, and then shall the death be robbed. Oh, death, where is our sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The original apostolic church, the original apostolic church, he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. We live in a generation for the professional ecclesiastical pimps and Balaams who are far higher, muzzled oxes that can't tread out the corn, and they dance to the tune of a deacon board, and they cannot preach truth any longer. And I am a, let me tell you, I wouldn't blame you if I had to go to a Sunday night service where Dr. Popsicle delivered his frozen TV dinner sermon and made sermonettes, preached to Christianettes to make out of them minor lips while they stay home in front of their television sets and suck on cigarettes. Every cigarette has two ends. On one end is a fire, on the other end is a sucker. If you got the Holy Ghost, you ought to be clean. We don't smoke dope and we don't sip alcohol. We don't pop pills. We got the original party right here.
appointed Sunday night to sit home and watch your NFL team lose. And you go crazy when they kick a pig skin through the goalpost. And those little anti-patriotic, whoremongering, anti-Christ, high priests of sin and Satan that won't stand up for the national anthem, but a bow in disgrace and shame. Shame on you if you play Sunday night for the NFL. I'll tell you what you need to do. It's the first generation. We are the first generation that has been handed more than any generation. We have not had the work in the field. We have not had the break from dust to dawn of work. And man, but everything's been given to us. And we've raised a generation of ingrates. We've raised a generation of unthankful and unholy who sit in front of television and games and expect somebody to give them something. The world doesn't owe you anything. It's time for the original apostle to get their Bible under their arm and get out in the streets and tell somebody about Jesus. I've got an ask. But if you are more entertained by television and the things of this world and pornography and sex trench movies and all of the games that are cannibalistic and picking up prostitutes and grand theft autos, you need the Holy Ghost. God can't dwell in you and you watch evil stuff. You need to get back to the old landmark. <laughs> Say, let God arise. I'm a regional apostolic. I don't need the world to entertain me. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. Just like the Bible said, I've got it in my hands. And I've got it in my hands. And when I think about the goodness of you, and all he's done, Original apostolics. Take me an aisle right here. Original apostolics. This is how it works. And Peter found Philip. And Philip found Bartholomew. And Bartholomew found Nathaniel. And said, come see a man. We have found him of who the prophets have spoke. The original apostolics went from house to house. They didn't have time for the things of this world. They sold out to the world. They gave themselves wholly over to Jesus. And they said, we're going all or nothing, or it's all for nothing. Oh, where are the original apostolics that'll walk the streets of their neighborhoods and knock on doors and invite somebody to church? And then uh, every Sunday morning in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Life Tabernacle, I want bus one to come here. Stand right here. Hey Amen. They come about a 10-foot aisle right here. Bus number one gets on bus number one. And this man and woman, brother and sister Busby, come quickly and stand here. And bus two come and three. Come here. One, two, three. Y'all come on. Stand right here. And they got on their bus. And they averaged bringing 50 people, 52 people to church on Sunday morning. And then bus number two. And then bus number two with a man and a woman and his five children. They get on their bus every Sunday morning and they go through bus route number two and they brought they brought um, I think a hundred and one to church uh, on their bus and then bus number three is the Spanish route uh, they brought about 75 uh, and then bus number four and bus number five uh, brother and sister Williams come on quickly uh, and then we don't have time bus number five uh, and bus number five brought 114 to church uh, in one bus route uh, and bus number six brother Noel Morgan uh, he brought over 
of seven in a church. And then I'm talking about people that are 18 and younger. And bus number seven was won by bus number two. And bus number seven's a family of seven that brought 115 on one Sunday morning. I'm talking about the original apostolics. My house is full, but my fields are empty. Isn't it time that we quit being a sponge? If we have the only truth, we better start acting like it. We better get out there, get in front of that, get out from in front of the television, get out from in front of your Facebook, get out from in front of your Instagram, and get out and knock on the door. Get out and teach a Bible study. And then the wicked bus number, bus number uh, eight, bus number eight is Chris and Crystal. Amen. They were in the divorce court. He came wheeling into the church and said something about it made me pull in here. I couldn't go no further. And I saw you walking out by the fountain. And he came in. We prayed him through the Holy Ghost. They threw the divorce, divorce papers out. And in three years, they're driving a bus. He's got a call of God on his life. They knock a hundred and something doors a week. Bus number nine. Amen. Bus number nine. Sister Danielle and, and Sister Anna DeVille. Amen. And their sister and their dad drives the bus. 14 and 15 year old girls that go out in one of the worst zip codes in our city and bring little children to the house of God every week. Little children whose parents are high on dope. Little children whose parents never miss them from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. But they put them in the church. And God said, This is a original apostolics. And then there's bus number 10, a little, a little ex-Baptist girl who was won by bus number 13's brother. She, you know what? She was a good Baptist. She knew the word of God. She dressed modest, but she didn't know anything about Acts 238. And God said in John 4, I sent you to reap what you didn't sow. And if you'll get busy sowing, I'll let you reap what you never sown before. And you you can double and triple. And bus number 10. And bus number 11, Judah and Ethan. 13-year-old boys. They bought 75 on their highest Sunday. All they need is somebody to drive them around to pass out flyers. You don't need a doctorate degree. You don't need a PhD or a THD. To be original apostolic, all you need is a desire. Bus number 12, Shelby. They bring this little girl, and her bus brings more adults on their bus. Forty adults from the halfway house. More adults than any bus put together. Bus 13, Sister Lisa, ex-fundamental Baptist, who when the flood came through and destroyed their church, they came to the apostolic church. And her, and her daughter, Taylor, is one of the finest apostolic girls. If you look into Mary, you got to move to Baton Rouge. Amen. Fine apostolic girl. Bus number 14, bus number 15, Sister Jessica DeVille, a little girl, 18 years old, going to college. I graduated with a high 4.0, going to college in Maine's maintains a 3.5, and knocks doors every Saturday and brings a busload of children every Sunday. Bus number 16. Brother BJ and Sister Emily. Bus number 17. Bus number 17 is Sister Thompson and her daughter, Sister Nisi. Uh, this family, uh, several years ago, a woman called me from Kentucky uh, and said, go pray for my niece dying in the hospital. Uh, I didn't know the girl's name uh, except for knowing her name to know who to pray for. Uh, I prayed for her. She was in a coma and I never heard from him again. Uh, about eight years later, uh, I got a call uh, right after the great flood of 2016 and said, I want to tell you who I am. You came and prayed for me, and you never met me, but God healed me, and we're looking for a place to have church. And she and her mama and sisters and their pastor, Sister Mary Davis, came into church and met with me after Sunday morning and said, we want this to be our church. We want the original apostolic. In bus number 18, 
a sister, sister Parker, and bus number 19, Brother Earl and Sister Demetra, and their three children. You should have seen Brother Earl when he came to church. He had long dreadlocks. He had all kind of facial hair. But look at an apostolic man today. I said, you know, we are not citizens of this world, making our way to heaven. We're citizens of heaven, making our way to this world. John Dillinger, the great, the great gangster, the notorious, infamous gangster, said, I know I'm going to hell, but I'm going to take as many people with me to hell as I can. The original apostolic said, I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's only one thing right, and this is it. There is no other way to heaven but Acts 238 way. Brother Salvador, Brother Salvador right here, Sister Myra, they got a flyer on their door. Somebody said flyers don't work, door knocking don't work. We need a TV ministry. I'm a TV preacher. I'm a televangelist. Look at that stack of flyers under that. They got a flyer on their door, and he showed up. He showed up at midweek Tuesday night church. He said, I got this little green flyer on my door. And when he walked in there, Roman Catholic, never been in a Pentecostal church before, women doing the whirly bird, men running the back of the pews, the preacher was jumping off the pulpit. Crazy men. Somebody said, y'all are too fanatical. You better believe it. Somebody said, you are dogmatic. I thank God I had a dogmatic pastor. When I get sick and go to the doctor, I want a dogmatic doctor. I don't want some little doctor to lie to me and tell me nothing's wrong with me. Leave your money at the door when you go out. I want a dogmatic doctor to say you're dying. You better fix it. I want a dogmatic preacher. He said, I got that flyer on my door. And he said, I want to know more about it. I said, you need a Bible study. He said, when can we do it? I said, right away. He said, I own a restaurant up the road. He said, you ought to come. Me and him and, his, and two of his sons, 58 months ago, started on a Bible class that now the high Bible class, we fill his entire restaurant up every Wednesday night for the past 58 months. 87 people. He feeds them. I said, Brother Salvador, you're not going to be able to maintain this cost. He said, I want to do this. He said, I want other people to get what I've got. I want other people. Now he's original, and he's winning other originals, all because somebody got a flyer on their door. You ought to make up your mind. You're going to get sold out to Jesus. You're going to get sold out to Jesus. It's time to get sold out. Get your hands with me. As I drive into the subdivision, I notice there are children swarming over doorsteps and playing in almost every driveway. At first glance, it appears to be a very happy, thriving place. That's where I begin my work. As I approach the first door, with an invite in my hand, I can more clearly see what many cannot. The grassy yard is need of watering for their many dead patches with the dirt showing through underneath. Next to the broken sidewalk, there are bits of trash blown and scattered by the wind. As I lift my hand to ring the doorbell, I notice it is hanging from the wall with its wires exposed, so I knock instead. It takes several knocks for this loud music coming within. The face appears in the cracked window, partially covered by a blanket instead of a curtain. If 
finally the door opens just a crack and standing there is an angel. She's about five years old with the sad eyes of a teenager, hollowed out by years of depression. Her hair falls into her eyes, greasy from days of neglect. Her face with the yesterday's lunch remains stuck to it, and her fingernails have, rem have remnants of black grit from her recent enjoyment from making mud pies. Her unmatched clothes have been dug out from beneath a pile of dirty laundry in a corner. Nevertheless, she smiles up at me. Hello? I smile my sweetest smile as if to project my love to her if only through one smile. She's nervous, looking around her shoulder to see if there's someone else that I would be smiling at. That she thinks she's undeserving of such love. I stoop down to a level. I came here to see you. I tell her softly, oh, how her eyes light up. And once again, she has the innocent eyes of a child. I didn't tell her about Sunday school and how the big church bus will pick her up tomorrow morning and bring her to church. I tell her about the breakfast, songs, and puppets, and most of all, she's going to hear about Jesus, the one who loves her most. From inside, a man yells, who is that? Shut the door. I notice she flinched at his voice. I tell her to go get her mommy or daddy to come out so I can ask their permission for her to come to church tomorrow. She looks scared all of a sudden, and she seems to shrink back into herself, head down, eyes dull. But I tell her, I know you want to come, but I have to ask them. She turns and disappears for a few minutes. When she returns, she says her mommy is asleep and won't wake up. Her daddy isn't there, and I step into the house where it is dim and hot in the corner. In front of the television is a big burly man in cut-off jeans without a shirt and an empty beer can scattered around his chair. The tiny angel wrapped her little arms tightly around my legs and hid in my body. So I would stand in front of him, but I'm not the least bit scared. I feel as though a host of angels stand behind me and I'm facing a squatty, weak demon from hell's pits. Are you a dad, I ask? He says, no. His eyes are bloodshot and pupils dilated. I go through the whole invitation as quickly as possible, repeating myself several times as he says, huh? There she go, please. He says, I don't care. She and I quickly turn and go outside to the porch and excited, asking many questions, please. If I'm not outside when you get here in the morning, knock on my door in case they change their mind. And we hug and say goodbye, turn to walk away and take a deep breath and feel the Holy Ghost. Thank God for bringing me to this door. Thank God for giving me strength to go. As heartbreaking as it could seem, she's only got one hope, and that's that an original apostolic. If you can keep your head when all about your losing bears and blaming on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied on and not dealing lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good and to talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster, and you just treat those two imposters one and the same. If you can bear to hear the truth is spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you give your life to broken, stoop, build them up again with worn out tools. If you can force your heart and nerve and send you to serve your turn long after they're gone, when all that's left in you is the will that says to them, hold on, be strong. If you can make one heap of all life's earnings and risk them all in a turn of pitch and toss, lose, start again at your beginnings, never breathe a word about your loss. If you can walk with kings and never lose your virtue, talk with crowds, never lose a common touch. All men count with you, but none too much. The earth is yours, meek, and all that's in it, and what's more, you'll be like the original apostolics, my friend. We've heard sound doctrine from Wednesday night, and 
who heard stirring messages of pillars on yesterday morning and an anointed apostolic prophecy on yesterday evening. But my assignment today is consecration for the original apostolics to be soul winners. There's four calls to you today. Number one, there's a call from hell. Go tell my brother don't come here. I got five. There's a call from heaven, Jesus said, go. There's a call from without, Acts 16, a Macedonian vision. Come here. Come here. And there's a call from you. I can't keep it to myself. I gotta consecrate. Lord, I consecrate, I dedicate my life, my will to be Lord. If you can use these hands, if you can use this voice for your kingdom. Your glory, Lord. 